Well, guys, here we are. Um, another week just flown by, and as and as ever, it seems to be amazing people show up for us to have a conversation with them. So, on your behalf, I get the pleasure of chatting to in a moment uh, a fellow Glaswegian, much younger man than me, but he's putting his mark in the world, which is absolutely fantastic. I heard them on uh, the Low Carb MD podcast, one of my favourites at the moment. And it was just amazing to hear a Glaswegian talking away to those American doctors and them getting really excited about his ice cream and stuff. It was just fantastic. And then separately, uh, Ivor Cummings, who we all know has been on here and inspired all of us uh, to hear him conversing with Ivor was really, really exciting as well. So this is going to be a cracker. Um, so without further ado, can I welcome uh, Ali um, Houston onto the onto the, the the session? Ali, thanks for joining us. We're really excited about it. Thanks, Jack. It's really uh, it's really nice to join another Glaswegian. Um, Indeed, it's nice, like you say, to to see people uh, from this part of the world. I guess representing positive health strategies. You know, it's not um, something that was front and centre when I was growing up and I think the kind of education that we get growing up in this part of the world could be improved and um, it's uh, a, an honour and a pleasure to join you. I mean unfortunately of course we're labelled with probably in the, one of the worst places in the world, you know I'm saying Glasgow in the west of Scotland you know if it was a league table for dying prematurely we'd probably be top of it. I've said that often in my own programs and people understand that heart disease, cancer, strokes, we're pretty good at it. What's the probably reasons for it? Not just diet, but not the diet they all thought was wrong, but as we all know, a different diet. But anyway, um, so, I mean, like we tend to do, we kind of ask our guests to tell us a wee bit about their backstory, how, you know, where they come from. And then I suppose it leads into me asking, you know, how, you, how did you end up doing what you're doing now? Can you tell us a wee bit about your backstory, you know, and so on? People really enjoy that part. Sure, yeah. And I should qualify, you know, coming from Glasgow. There's Glasgow and there's Glasgow. And I, I don't, you know, I, I still wear it like a badge of honour, but I'm definitely from one of the train stations where the life expectancy is a bit higher. And you go from um, where I'm from in Jordan Hill, uh, east through the city centre, and then into the East End, and you lose a year of life expectancy every stop, they say. I'm, I'm, and, I'm glad you're saying that. And, uh, I, you know, but having said that, you know, there's heart disease in my family and uh, Alzheimer's too. And I was certainly quite unwell as a child. I had autoimmune problems, uh, digestive issues, kind of mood issues and um, migraines, terrible migraines, debilitating. And I had to have surgery twice on one of my autoimmune conditions, which restricted my uh, esophagus so that I couldn't actually take in food. And so they, instead of, you know, and this, this sort of speaks to the, the, the medical paradigm in the West at the moment of instead of uh, trying to get to the root cause of why people are chronically unwell, um, they do what they can to medicate and um, perform surgery on it. And of course, it allowed me to keep eating, but it was the wrong things that I was eating. And, um, you know, it took me another 25 years to get to the bottom of what was really wrong. Um, so, you know, going back to when I was a kid and then uh, leaving school, I worked in at restaurants, so I started off in you'll know Regano in the city centre. Indeed, we were just reminiscing about it yesterday, and it's closed at the moment, which is just a nightmare. I know all all that. I'm sure we can pick up on later, but uh, and I'm worried about the hospitality industry at yeah. the moment. But um, you know, I, I kind of I was fed well by my mum at home, and uh, I, but you know, kind of um, if I was left to my own devices, then I would eat kind of only beige food, and um, Regano was an eye opener. You know, I'd never seen lobster thermidor or Japanese crackers or any of the amazing things that I saw there. And it kind of opened my horizons. And um, after that, I worked in high end restaurants for a few years. And then I decided to go to uni. I ended up a bit of a left turn. I got a physics degree and uh, I was working in um, uh, the sciences really after that for a few years. So I started um, working in uh, laser engineering. 
and was working in uh, different roles in uh, Glasgow and laser factory, um, doing engineering and physics kind of stuff. And then um, I decided to start a PhD and on a long similar lines. So it was using laser physics to uh, investigate what hadn't been discovered yet, which have now, which is gravitational waves. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the problem was that my health issues had never really gone away since I was a kid. They'd, they'd gone up and down and they'd appeared in different forms. As I say, I had debilitating migraines, I had mood issues, so anything from depressive symptoms, anxiety. Um, I was actually diagnosed with ADHD and, um, by, a, by a consultant psychiatrist. Uh, and again, you know, there was medication involved, but nothing really striking to the root cause. No. And things kind of came to a head when I was studying from a PhD and I couldn't actually focus properly. Now, I knew I wasn't stupid. I'd done a physics degree. Um, I'd you'd done fine at my laser physics job and I just couldn't focus and I couldn't access my brain power. Yeah. And I was fortunate, I think, that one of my supervisors at the PhD, a professor called Ken Strain, who was part of the gravitational wave team um, yeah. for many years, and he'd, uh, he'd been quite unwell about 10 years prior. He'd uh, come down with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, yeah. and um, anyone who, who's had that or knows anyone who's had that knows how frightening it is and he was told by his doctors that he probably wouldn't work again in his early 40s and he and then he decided to do what he does best which is to dive into the research yep. and um, I think his first point of um, call might have been Gary Taubes's yeah. good calories bad calories yeah 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 and uh, after kind of using that as a doorway he discovered low carb um, low linoleic acid yeah. and um, you know the omega-6 polyunsaturated fat so he, he went really low carb and within six months he was running 10ks again mm -hmm. so he kind of continued continues to be a physics professor uh, of some esteem you know fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and yeah, yeah. um, got the uh, the the uh, the special, I've forgotten its official name, the Special Prize for Physics that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is part of the consortium. Um, it's a prize that's given out to um, breakthrough. It's the, bre the Breakthrough Prize in Physics. Right, right. And um, he was uh, part of the group that received a share of that. So, you know, uh, continues to do amazing work. And on, this, on the side, he's uh, an expert, I would say, in nutrition science. And so by the time I arrived, he was able to, listen to what was going on for me and uh, kind of helped me identify what was what was maybe the, at the root cause um, pointed me in the direction of books blogs uh, nutrition papers yeah. and um, I ended up studying nutrition more than I was studying physics yeah. and decided to uh, give low carb a go and uh, I started eating paleo low carb and um, early 2016 and almost overnight within a few days my health problems started to disappear and within several months I would say with uh, a couple of supplements uh, as well I effectively didn't have health problems anymore um, I was so astounded by this that I decided to combine the nutrition science that I'd learned uh, with my passion for food that I'd uh, you really struck up after school um, in the in the high end restaurants that I'd worked in, and start a business which would get this information and way of eating out to as many people as I could. Yeah. Uh, so that's when I started my business, Paleo Canteen, and I left the PhD. Um, and a, here I am now, uh, three and a bit years later. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean. I I'm so grateful for you sharing the story, particularly about your professor friend. You know, if he hadn't sort of opened his mind to the counter research, like or the counter view, different paradigm, 
find Gary Tobbs or whoever it was, um, we'd have lost him. <laughs> we, you know, the, the world would have lost him into his disease and he would have been getting treatment the way they would have done. And yet by, and this is the thing that is why I continue to do this and I'm sure it's what's going to drive you is there are millions of people lost uh, because of the paradigm uh, that you've right, rightly said, they, they want to medicate and they want to operate and it never occurs to them what's the cause. And it certainly would never occur to them that the cause could be as simple as what people are eating. Um, frightening really. So tell us a wee bit about what um, uh, Paleo Canteen is. It's a fa I mean, I, when, when I heard your name, I thought, that's a fantastic name, really brilliant. So tell us a bit about, what, about the brand, what it is, what it started out as. I know it's evolving, all brands do. But tell us a wee bit about a Paleo Canteen. Sounds quite exciting. Sure, yeah. Um, and absolutely agree with, you know, the idea that Ken had to be open-minded because it's, it is against the mainstream. And for some, I think I was lucky coming from a physics hard science background that it was a hard scientist who was saying this to me because otherwise it can sound um, fringe and um, a bit cookie if you like. Yeah. And although I'm open to these things, um, it was partly the fact that Ken had been open to it and Ken's position in society and uh, yeah. as a hard scientist, which lent that weight to it. And um, I feel lucky that I found it through him and also, like you say, that society has kept a, um, a happy and productive member because of that open-mindedness. And I think it is coming more into the mainstream. And I'll talk about Paleo Canteen yeah. um, and sort of try and join them together because I was talking to a, a, a consultant in the, in the food industry just last week who said that where a vegan was five years ago, that's where paleo, low carb, keto is now in the UK, yeah. um, that it's about to explode. And I think um, it works. So it's you can't really put that genie back in the bottle. No. I think once people try it and tell folk about it, yeah. some, people, some other people try it, they share results, especially in this day and age when it's not like an Atkins day where you bring out a book, it sells really well because it works really well. And then you have a kind of um, slow lumbering media kind of slinging mud at, at you because it's eating into other people's yeah. profits. Yeah. Whereas now you've got um, a short circuit there. You know, you can't, you just, you can't um, really interrupt the chain of yeah. uh, communication in these uh, Facebook groups and online communities on social media where they share tips and tricks about how low carb works. So I think, it's um it's uh it's 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 um it's snowballing, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and and where Paleo Canteen comes in is really <laughs> it was funny because I felt when I started the business really like I'd just jumped off and decided to grow wings on the way down, as it were. Yeah. And I I I I, I was so convinced by the signs and um the inevitability of low carb, paleo, keto growing over the next five or 10 years yeah. that I just started the business with um, a kind of hope that it would come good and that I would find the correct way to find um, things to sell in the niche. Yes. So it started in Glasgow in um, a famous music venue called King Tuts. Oh yes. Really just because we knew the manager and uh, we did the food in the kitchen there for nine months and uh, it was fun. You know, we did the food for the bands. We, uh, it was actually, it's, it, as a venue, it's quite famous for uh, having signed um, or being the venue at which Oasis signed their first record contract with Alan McGee, the Scottish music promoter who signed them up. Great, yes. <laughs> They'd, um, they'd blagged their way onto the bill, apparently, and Alan McGee had snapped them up. Yeah. Uh, and I, I catered uh, Liam Gallagher's music video um, shot by Shane Meadows there, uh, which was 25 years after the 
after Oasis had been signed. That was a couple of years ago. That was interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, it was good fun. And, and we did, um, you know, a couple of music festivals and uh, food festivals and just developed the brand and what we were trying to do with the food, which was really sell healthy food. Yeah. And our definition is that it can be low carb yeah. uh, if that's what you need. Yeah. Um, but basically the... Um, the thrust of paleo, for those who don't know, is that we evolved eating certain foods and we can be pretty sure that there were certain foods which weren't available to us when we were evolving. Yeah. So the logic is if our ancestors who made us ultimately were the ones who survived in the environment, then the foods that were available are likely to be pretty healthful yeah. and the ones that weren't available may be healthy but should be sus uh, suspected of yeah. uh, provi of uh, giving ill health unless otherwise proven innocent yes. so that's the basic idea and there's a couple of gray areas like you know people don't want to stop drinking which is fair enough it's uh, if you if you like it and it, it doesn't impinge on your life too much yeah. Um, and dairy is another one, you know, so I think a lot of people who like the idea of paleo, but dairy doesn't bother them at all, uh, might call themselves primal. Um, and I, I, I eat dairy. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, grains can be a gray area. So, you know, some people have no problem with things like rice or barley or whatever. But uh, my feeling from the literature is that gluten grains are bad news for a lot more people than we suspect certainly for me with a history of autoimmune problems so i steer well clear um and carbs per se aren't harmful you know there's plenty of traditional societies who eat a lot of their calories through uh you know sweet potatoes or plantains or whatever but these are people who have always been metabolically healthy which for the western population is probably in the 10 to 20 percent range so if you're one of those lucky 10 to 20% who've always been um, fit, healthy, uh, then you're probably fine with eating carbs. But if um, you're in that 80, 90% who aren't, then, then you could probably do with cutting back. Um, so that's the kind of, there's no sort of um, quick sound bite for me. Uh, I, I want to be complete about how I describe what I do and um, I don't want I don't want to sell snake oil I want to be clear about what some people need and some people don't and I want to provide products and services that really meet that need and um, you know I uh, I feel like empowering people to make food is probably the the, the best single way um, to help folk get into it so that's why um, John Meakin, the chef who I work with, um, wrote Low Carb on a Budget, which is the cookbook that just came out last month that addresses one of the common attacks on low carb is that it's some kind of posh, middle class, exclusive diet yeah. where it's all about salmon and fillet steak. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, I think some of the best some of the best meals I eat are extremely cheap and you can, you know, you, the butcher's almost giving the stuff away. Um, yeah. So we came out with a cookbook and the other, the other thing that was important to me when I started low carb was um, eating low carb ice cream. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a brilliant blog, which partly got me onto low carb called Hyperlipid, which is, which is probably strictly for the nerds. Um, yeah, yeah. There's, but it's very, it's very nerdy, scientific. But um, he does share a recipe for uh, low-carb low ice cream. So I used to make that all the time. And I thought, well, why can't there be a product on the shelves that does that, where it's much more convenient and you know, a variety of flavors and so on. So uh, that's what I'm working on. And I'm, I've, just, uh, I've just brought it out in the last couple of months. It's on the shelves in shops in, in Scotland, and we'll be um, bringing it to the rest of the UK as soon as we possibly can. Um, it's called Scoundrel. Um, so that's that's what Paleo Canteen is about, and what we what we do. Um, and I hope that I can keep expanding what I'm doing with it to bring the kind of food 
that people want and people enjoy um, so that more and more people realize that eating like this isn't a privation, it's, uh, it's a joy. Yeah. And um, I'd love to hear what people would want to see uh, on the shelves. The next, the next thing I'm looking at is low polyunsaturated fat pork, you know, uh, charcuterie, because that's something that is a little bit of an issue in the low carbon keto community, I think, is, um, you know, people kind of think, well, what, uh, what snacks and other things can I eat? And a lot of baking and so on gets done with nut flours and um, sometimes people use veg oils and in my view, eating too much of these things is uh, not a great idea. And the reason is that there's a fat, a fatty acid, a polyunsaturated fat called linoleic acid, which yeah. is, is in these things. And um, I've done a couple of uh, podcast episodes on this, one with um, a couple with Tucker Goodrich, who's literally writing the book on it right now. Yeah. And he's got a great uh, blog called Yelling Stop, which talks about this a lot. And lots of other doctors and Healthcare yeah. professionals are are on to this now. Um, Ivor Cummins included. Yeah. Um, and the problem with uh, pigs and chickens is that they've got one stomach, and they're not like uh, beef and sheep. If you feed the beef and sheep um, corn, then it's not ideal for them. But um, the way their stomachs work mean that you don't get that linoleic acid persisting through to their fat but that's not the case for pigs and chickens. So any sort of soy, oil, or um, corn that they eat, they end up getting uh, extra linoleic acid. So what I'm working on at the moment is working towards making things like salami and um, other charcuterie that, that we all love to eat and that are great snacks if you're low carb, but using pork that's been raised so that their fat is like it would have been if they were foraging out in the wild and full, you know, firm and white and um, low in linoleic acid and therefore much better for health. Yeah. So watch out for that. That'll probably be next year. But at the moment, cookbook and, and ice cream, that's what I'm all about. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. No, it's a, it, and inevitably, I want to sort of cut back on some of the things people say and I, I'm just reminded that you mentioned that you were diagnosed with ADHD or whatever and and you've had challenges with um, your for what better your mental health in terms of getting depressed or whatever and and possibly even just your mind fog thing that was getting in the way of your studies and and you've also mentioned and I'm grateful for you mentioning it that hope and I thought hope you're right and I hope that it's not five years, it might be three years, that you know where veganism is at the moment, or where it was five, ten, five years ago is where paleo and low carb and keto is right now. I, th I, think, I think you're probably right. I mean, I, I've traveled a lot to the, to the States and you know, you, you, even supermarkets, you get to the end and you're, you're looking at the magazines at the checkouts and there's, there's paleo, lots of paleo magazines, tons of keto magazines. It's been there for years. I've never, ever, ever, ever uh, yet had the word keto anywhere in a British supermarket. And I've never, certainly a newspaper I read a lot online would be The Guardian. It's never showing up in The Guardian either, which is, if you think about it, just ridiculous. But, but there you go. Um, it's interesting, there was an article in The Guardian just this very weekend with Adrian Childs. You, you know, he... he not that long ago, he was on our TV screens all the time. Um, he seemed to be the, the golden boy at the time. Now he does, I found out just the other day, he does a, apparently he's on Five Live or something, at lunchtime or something, which is good. I'm glad he's still getting some work. Because I really like the guy, but he does this article in The Guardian every week. It's usually quite good reading, but he talks about his ADHD and other challenges he's had and how he's, as you said, Let's cut it out. Let's uh, let's medicate it, and it's he's having all these side effects, but he's feeling good because he's finally got to the bottom of it. And you're thinking, oh my god! If only, and, and and recently I watched him in a TV series where he's obviously a big guy now. You know, he's put on the weight. He's not looking healthy, and you're thinking, God, if only 
it was already five years down the line. He would probably find us. But so so the I like your idea of tackling the salamis and stuff like that. That's really, really quite exciting. I also how did you come up with scoundrel? I, I my 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 son runs a a business in branding of uh, particularly alcohol all around the world, but he also does a food thing. So I'd be very, very interested in where you come up with Scoundrel. I think it's fantastic. Tell me about that. Thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, you know, there's that fine line I was talking about between the kind of diet purists who, when they start eating in a particular way, yeah. will cast heretics out and <laughs> there's a, you know, a, there'll be a holy gospel of, Paleo keto veganism, whatever. Indeed. And I think, and I think, paleo canteen is called paleo. So I think, to some extent, I should honour that and um, not misadvertise. No. So that's fine. So I decided to do a separate brand for the ice cream because you know it's got double cream in it, which is more primal than paleo, and it's um, it's got it's it's got uh, stabilisers and emulsifiers, which you just need to to make a commercial ice cream and i'm yeah. totally fine with it um and it's got sweeteners natural sweeteners erythritol and stevia they don't spike your, your blood sugar they um they are they're metabolically inactive they're brilliant yeah. um but some people don't want that either and it's it's you know probably not what you would call paleo so i thought you know that probably should go under a, a separate brand so yeah. um gave me a, a chance to um you know, get my thinking cap on and work out which way to go with it. Now, there's the kind of um, sort of religious feel of Halo Top, and uh, you know, like you're like you're an angel if you yeah. eat Halo Top versus yeah. um, Hagen Dazs or something. <laughs> and uh, I it's like the going. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I preferred the idea of a allowing yourself to feel a, a little bit devilish yes so i feel like scoundrel to me means um mm -hmm. that you're you're being a bit cheeky that you're breaking the rule you're bending the rules without breaking them uh, and you're getting away with it yeah so after some um little focus groups with friends um that's what that's what we came up with and you know the whole idea is that it's uh, uh, a bridge away from from the worst foods and something that you can eat and uh, I wouldn't say that it's the kind of thing that you would want to eat for breakfast lunch and dinner um, <laughs> you might you might do you might do uh, I certainly well I've got access to it and I tend to have some every day and I feel brilliant and yeah. um, it's it's I think it's great you know it's exactly the the product that I wanted to bring to the market, um, and that so that so that's where Scoundrel comes from. I think we've got a we've got a logo which is um, a, a scoop of ice cream with uh, a grin on its face on a spoon. I'm not sure why it's so happy it's about to get eaten, but uh, it's called Scamp, and there's a I don't know, there's a cast of characters that um, are going to be coming out. So there's a bar of chocolate who's walking about. He's called Mr. Chip, yeah. and um, he's called Chip. Excuse me, and then there's a there's a there's a, a spoon who's like the the villain, and he's called yeah. Mr. Spoon. So he's running running after them all, trying to catch them. Yeah. So it's 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 fun, and I think yeah. it's it's a, it's a way that people who are eating low carb or even just want to you know um, give give a treat to their kids at meal time without feeling guilty, um, which I think is probably the wider market for mm -hmm. it. Um, where it's a luxury, delicious ice cream that kids can't tell the difference between, um, but there's no sugar in it. So uh, I think, you know, thinking about people referring to their children as their little scoundrels also plays into that. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. I mean, I think those, I mean, I've been pushing since I got into it, low carb and or keto for about four, four, maybe four and a half years now. I've been on it four and a half years. Um, and like you, you find it immediately if solves health challenges big time, you want to tell the world. Uh, and so I've been doing that with my posts on Facebook particularly. 
and for people who are still with me, obviously, were quite happy to read that. They might not have agreed with it, but they, they didn't shun me altogether. Some did, but you know, most people haven't. Um, and, and when you do make the, or you're going into the transition towards low carb or keto, you inevitably are, and we had this conversation last week, is what do you think you're going to really, really, really miss? Could you find a al keto alternative? Like, like breads or cakes or what the Americans call cookies, you know, biscuits and stuff. And, and you do, you know, you can find them. And so if you find them, they help you over a little bridge when it's tough at the beginning. But one of the things is, I, without doubt, when Ka Carrie Brown, who, you know, she, you've probably heard of Carrie Brown, but if you haven't, you'll know that she, she's written a great book on low-carb ice cream or keto ice cream. But, and you go and buy the book and you buy the, you buy the equipment, but it's still... To make it is a bit of a nuisance, you know, because you can't just make it immediately. It takes two days, and by the time you get to the days, the, the need for it's gone. But what I love is what you're doing. I mean, if people can just go to a decent place or a, a shop, or hopefully we'll get it in the other shop, and get a keto ice cream, oh, my God, that's going to make life so much easier for so many people, you know. Uh, and let's be honest, most of us like ice cream, for goodness sake, and let's all be scoundrels, you know. <laughs> so tell us, tell us a wee bit more. I mean, what I found was I found it fascinating that, you know, someone who's got an interest in making it accessible to ordinary people, right, managed to get yourself all over the world so quickly in all these podcasts. I mean, that's been pretty cool for you. Was that a deliberate thing when you reached out to the guys or did you just, is it word of mouth? But just like I found you and I thought I'd better let people hear about you. A bit of both, really. Um, when I'd left uh, King Tut's uh, and was doing more events and working towards um, doing a meal delivery service, which I did uh, last year for a while um, to develop the brand, I decided to do some videos which were a mixture of analysing some of the rubbish science out there which debunk, tries to debunk low carb which um fails and i thought you know i could do a couple of videos about that with my science and food background um and so i did a couple of videos on that and they were widely shared and uh, i think they made me a few friends yeah and then i did a video that was a wee bit longer that was about my mental health and really kind of describing what I did to improve it, which included uh, a few supplements, um, which I'm happy to talk about, because I think that's something that um, often gets overlooked. A, certainly a bit of one-to-one -one counseling, um, which I would recommend to anyone who, who's, who, you know, who can afford it and who um, gets a good recommendation. A, I certainly was very careful about who I was spending time with, which yeah. I'm sure you'll agree is um, an important component of, of mental health. Yeah. But undoubtedly, the greatest difference was made by what I put in my mouth. And it was kind of like, and I, th and I think I said this in the Low Carb MD podcast, Siobhan Huggins, who'd been on the same podcast uh, you know, a couple of months ago, had said she was in a car park one day and realized that a few months after she'd gone low carb that she was content yeah now to me that's absolutely remarkable and it completely chimes with my experience i um would be quite high in summer and uh, have a good mood and then it would reach probably this time of year and i would start to dread the next day which is a really sad thing to say because it went on for 25 years <clears throat> until I found low carb. Oh. And what I found was that, you know, I, I did my best, you know, I, I, uh, I took, a, I took uh, pills that might help. I took, um, uh, I had a seasonal affective disorder yes. uh, lamp, you know, the high brightness LED lamp, which made some, which had some effect. But what I didn't realize until I went low carb uh, and supplemented a bit was that the root cause was what I was eating and it came to October November and 
I felt great. I had that same high, even mood yeah. that I had during the summer. And I thought, wow, this is unbelievable and so i put all that into this uh, video and that got even more widely shared if anything and i think um brian lenskis and tro Collegian, who do the low carb md podcast they saw that video and a uh, it was um brian who asked me on to the low carb md podcast i think when he saw that i had the book out he knew that really i brought that kind of experience and learning to fruition um into something that he wanted to recommend and so that was that was really nice because i've got so much respect for those guys they kind of they're the vanguard in america and they they have to take a lot of flack from haters and naysayers who kind of to me i think you can split hairs about the exact nature of the science as it's established so far but there's an issue with contradicting doctors who have huge clinical experience of this working uh, extremely well with patients who've gone 20, 30, 40 years unable to shift excess weight or improve their blood markers, especially given that there seems to be very little or no risk involved you know, like David Unwin says, yes. um, if there is a risk, would someone tell me where it is, please? Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but, um, you know, and that's, that's how I got involved with uh, Brian and Tro. And um, with Ivor, I asked him um, if and he very kindly accepted me to come on his show. Uh, I think because I um, have some experience in the hospitality industry and He's kind of, his background is uh, biochemical engineering, but obviously he uh, got into uh, eating low carb and the, the science behind it and uh, debunking the idea that um, high LDL cholesterol is somehow uh, causative in heart disease. So he's, you know, master of um, yeah. understanding that side of things, but he's been very involved in understanding the science of uh, the coronavirus. So. I am very concerned at the moment about the hospitality industry, which I've worked in some, I've got family and friends whose livelihood depends on the hospitality industry in one way or another. Yeah. And um, the truth is, and I think a lot of people don't realize this, that the margins, the profit margins involved in bars, restaurants, hotels, etc., cetera, um, especially in small uh, family run places are very thin and, really the the difference between success and failure is uh marginal and you know you really have to be pretty full most weekends of the year in order to to do better than break even and be able to pay yourself mm. um and you know that's at the best of times so when restrictions are put in place for one reason or another it quickly becomes unviable and we've seen that with um yep. uh with Cine World. Uh, announcing closure of all of their sites in the US, UK and Ireland yeah, um, I think the fact that they're an enormous multinational means that they have probably a more savage approach to a profit and loss the, the, the thing that I think we'll, we'll see uh, in the next few months if restrictions aren't lifted is that people who have no, no choice but to plough on you know, people who've put their remortgaged house or life savings into small businesses yes. will have to keep going until you know they get foreclosed on but that that is coming if we don't get vocal about telling our MPs yeah. we want sensible precautions not unnecessary restrictions yeah you're absolutely right. I mean I get 30 years of running business you know small businesses various but small businesses but it's and mostly this work that I did for years um yeah you're right I mean especially if you get staff and stuff you, you, it doesn't take long for you to start beginning to really get challenged if the cash flow isn't happening but the, but the thing of course is you're talking about um people feel suddenly feeling content part of being content 
in the modern age has been even if you just going into a, a cafe and sitting down or, or a bar or sitting out somewhere in summer or winter with something to eat. Um, if that all goes, in some of the great restaurants of Glasgow and some of the, particularly if you mentioned Roganos, one can't imagine the city without those things, but they could very easily happen. And, it, and it's not easy to come back. Um, and as you quite rightly said, some of them will have had remortgaged their homes, got big bank loans. I've been there, you know, and banks don't mind when they're feeling good giving you it, but when they're not feeling good, they'll take it off you and cause all sorts of havoc. So it is, it is challenging, and it's particularly challenging when you just hear people who don't really know any better spouting the paradigm that's been presented to us by for whatever reason, in various countries around the world, fairly consistent, but there is credible science that's saying, wait a minute, you're doing the wrong thing here. Especially closing down <laughs> business and wiping out people. I, I, it is quite, um, it is a quite a challenging time. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it either that people who contract COVID and who are seriously challenged with it have a very, very, very unpleasant time. And deaths aren't pleasant the way it's happening it's not just like you know it's not good at all but it's avoidable that's the thing that's so challenging and as Iber said often in his in various people and you've said it yourself even in this show within days people can reverse out of the, dan the danger area within days within 14 days definitely um why wouldn't people because but they don't know there's you know Adrian Childs has no idea that all he needs to do is change his food and he would be probably be fine. Um, so tell, tell me a bit more, I know, I know that I've heard you speak about it, but tell me because you've got the scientific background, I don't have, I just follow it by listening to the podcast and I hear it and I read it and I go, okay, I'm, I'm, I, I'm trusting these guys. Do you know, I, I tend to trust them because of the voice. I, I'm an audio thinker, I hear someone's voice, does it resonate? Are they being honest? Probably. You know, so yeah, I've, I've had Professor Tim Noakes on here. Well, I don't know if you've had the privilege of listening to his voice, but oh my God, um, Dr. Eric Westman, you hear his voice and you just, you just melt because you know, there's all that honesty. There's all that 30 years experience and more. And begging the world to listen, you know, begging the world. So tell us a wee bit more about your passion for COVID. I know that you're passionate about it and you're indirectly doing something about it by introducing Scoundrel, ultimately, in the book. And we'll come back to the book, but just tell me about bit COVID, because that's why we set ourselves up here. The reason this happened was back in March when all the fear and anxiety was rampant, because I got some tools and techniques and I knew about, obviously, keto and stuff. I thought I would just do a Facebook Live thing on a Wednesday night, got a lot of viewers, and we've stuck with it. And my whole passion is, is like, look, let's protect ourselves from COVID. And then the next one, Number 20, number 21, you know, 19's tough as it is, but, you know, let's make sure we can survive these things. Especially a lot of the people in my group are a wee bit older, you know, they're in the 50s and 60s, they're a bit with me when I was doing my stuff, and some older, and um, we're interested in the longevity as well. But tell us about your attitude to COVID, what you're finding, because you're obviously mixing with scientists and other people, and you're you're obviously well read and you're accessing information. What, what would you say to the people following us about your view of COVID? Sure. Well, actually, I've, I've, I've heard Dr. Eric Westman on other podcasts. Uh, I've never spoken to him myself. Yeah. Uh, I agree um, about his voice and about what he says. And certainly with Professor Tim Noakes, who was on my podcast and who is, um, you know, a, a fine, upstanding man. And he's one of those scientists that publicly admitted he was wrong and changed his mind I know, I know. and I think one of the the key figures for me in COVID was um, Anders Tegnell in the, the uh, epidemiologist in Sweden and another was um, one of the the chief health advisors in Norway yeah now Sweden is probably the most important country to talk about with COVID yeah. because they act as a kind of control point in 
Northern Europe because they didn't lock down. They imposed some social distancing yeah. and some people worked from home. Yeah. Apart from that, schools were kept open the whole time. Businesses were allowed to op- stay open the whole time. Yeah. Um, and where they got it wrong was where any area that got hit badly got it wrong. They thought they were protecting hospitals by sending COVID positive elderly people back to care homes. Mm-hmm. And think well. Anders Tegnell, I think I'm getting his name right, haven't I? It sounds I don't, right. I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> it sounds right, but that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I understand. Um, he publicly apologised for that mistake. And I think that, that shows the measure of the man. Yeah. The Norwegian health advisor that I'm talking about came out and said, we could have got the same result in Norway without lockdown. And there will not be another lockdown in, in Norway. Yeah. So I think that says it all for me. At the moment in Sweden, they are more or less back to normal. They are treating um, coming into autumn and winter, traditional cold and flu season, as anyone normally would, which is to avoid visiting elderly relatives or people who are at risk if you feel unwell. Otherwise, just performing the usual... um, you know, safety precautions like washing your hands and uh, sneezing into your elbow and all the rest of them. Yeah, yeah. So to me, that's the most important data point. I mean, my personal understanding of it, um, and I have a real need to understand these things. You know, I'll, I'll spend a couple of hours a day looking at the, the data, the graphs, yeah. weighing up people's opinions and... Um, and that's evolved over the course of since, you know, the turn of the year when we were seeing some sort of slightly disturbing images from Wuhan of hospitals yeah. being built in eight days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then come to um, March and you have a very disturbing, uh, very, you have very disturbing reports coming out of, of Italy. Yeah. Um, very disturbing images of a uh, hospital or hospitals overflowing people dying because they don't have covid but because they can't get into intensive care because there's so many covid patients yeah. and then what really i think sealed the uh, decision making process was a report that everyone saw because it was reported around the world's media was from imperial college london mm. um, by a guy called neil ferguson yeah yeah. And he predicted about a million dead in the UK and uh, if we didn't do anything, and maybe half that, even if we did. So that was very wrong. And it made uh, wrong assumptions about how um, COVID behaves. Yeah. When I saw the report, I thought, well, if he's right, well, we definitely need to do it everything we can to stop it yeah now what i understood what i've understood since is that uh, pandemic planning is something that governments around the world spend money on and pretty much all of the pandemic planning i've seen including reports prior to covid from the world health organization and the american center for disease control Mm -hmm. you know large legitimate organizations say that in previous pandemics what tends to happen is people insist on quarantines aka lockdown and mask use but what they find is that these non-pharmaceutical interventions typically don't actually alter the course of the disease progression in a population that if fewer if if less than 1% of your population has been infected, then a quarantine w- might slow the infection, uh, which if, if the illness is extremely severe in a lot of the people that it infects 
and therefore threatens to overwhelm the intensive care units in your hospitals, yeah. it might be worth thinking about lockdown. So with that logic in mind, maybe at the very start, it might have helped to delay the infections. And that's why we started hearing calls for flattening the curve. Yeah. But for some reason, when it became clear that the infections had already peaked and that hospitals weren't at risk, even though there was a lot of people very sadly succumbing yeah. to it, yeah. um, it, the goalpost changed. So instead of lockdown being about flattening the curve, it became about elimination, which uh, I think a lot of people, including people like professors um, Sunetra Gupta and um, Carl Hennigan, who are both at Oxford University, yeah. you know, we're saying, wait a minute, maybe quarantines, lockdowns can flatten the curve a little bit, uh, if at all. And there's some argument for saying that if you think the hospitals are going to be overwhelmed. But ultimately, this disease will move through the population and you just have to be, be as sensible as you can about choosing how it does so, which I think, and I think they think too, would be to allow people who are more at risk of worse outcomes, which would be metabolically unhealthy or you know, people who have obesity or, or, type, two, or type 2 diabetes um, or people who are over a certain age, and it's a sliding scale of risk. So I would just say communicate that risk to the population yeah, yeah. and then enshrine in law their right to shield. So if people want to work from home or uh, not be exposed to other people, then they should be allowed to avoid other people. Yeah. But crucially, you should not limit the movement of people who are much less at risk of harm because if you do so, then you may slow the uh, movement of the virus around the population, thereby extending the life of the virus in the population and the risk to the elderly and so on. So it's a bit counterintuitive, but that's my understanding of it based on people like Professor Sinetra Gupta, Carl Hennigan, uh, Professor Michael Levitt, um, people like this who, um, who, who seem... Uh, very well read on the exact subject yep. and uh, make perfect sense to me. So yep. I think what Sweden's done is stick to their plan in spite of massive uh, media um, frightening uh, stories. Information, yep. And um, they've been, I think, proven correct. Um, except in the instance that they already apologized about, which is something that Scotland, England, New York, New Jersey, Italy, Spain did, which was send ill people back to care homes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's been my evolution of understanding of it. And it comes to the point now where I think there's a bit of a tipping point happening. It's not there yet, but I think public opinion is shifting slightly away from more lockdowns. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, an open letter was sent to, Matt Hancock, the uh, health secretary, by a group of British GPs saying we shouldn't be doing more lockdowns. So when the, when the doctors publicly come out and start saying that, I think even if you think maybe I'm some kind of diet crank, um, <laughs> even, even, if you, even if you think Professors Sunetra Gupta, Carl Hennigan, Michael Levitt have just called it wrong, then surely a consortium of GPs who are saying this is doing more harm than good um, should start to convince people. So that's my hope really is that we get there in time to um, save people's yeah. livelihoods and, uh, and lives in terms of um, the excess uh, cancer deaths, heart disease deaths and mental health deaths, which are undoubtedly being caused by lockdown. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so too, desperately hope so. I, I think, unfortunately, what's happened primarily because of the politics of division, particularly in the US, um, this argument that we're, or this explanation that you've just given, immediately people think in that divided country, particularly, ah, this guy must be a Trump, Trump supporter, this guy obviously he's got some right-wing leanings or something of that nature, couldn't possibly be a Democrat or a, 
a socialist or whatever they want to call them over there. The truth of the matter is that it seems to me the wrong people have got the wrong information. Um, it's quite challenging as a Guardian reader for God knows how many years to see that this is very rarely featured in the Guardian. But funnily enough, I have read it occasionally because on weekends I check out the other media, see what they're up to. And uh, there are people questioning it. And for example, the Times, even the Telegraph. Why is the Guardian not pushing this, etc.? You know what I mean? It's quite interesting. But so it seems to have get caught up with the wrong side, it seems to me. The people who would normally question the authorities or question the establishment aren't questioning it. Um, and then it's, a very, it's a very interesting people uh, who are The people who are questioning it, unfortunately, have got the wrong brand, <laughs> for want of a better word. But, uh, so thanks for sharing your stuff about COVID. I appreciate that. But let's go back because time just, time just runs away. Um, tell us about the book. Tell us about your passion for the book and how people can get a hold of it. Sure. Well, um, yeah, just, uh, I want to go on record and echo what you say about the about COVID issue becoming a, a left-right bun fight. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was such a shame because yep. it, needed, it needn't be. It's, um, it's uh, I'm the same as you. Uh, I'm on the left on, yep. on um, pretty much every issue. And I, it's not that I, dislike people who are on the right it's a Glasgow thing <laughs> I think you're right yeah it's, it's hard to find a Tory up here um and that you know I, I've, I've you know I've got friends who are conservative and I think it comes down to a matter of priorities and yeah. upbringing and all the rest of it and I don't dislike people who who are conservative by any means no, it's just not. that um yes. I'm not but I uh I, I think it, you're right that it's it's uh it's it became a, a tribal thing and it's very unfortunate because and, and it is confusing, you know, like at the moment you have um, people on the left defending a conservative government, um, basically kind of attacking them, but defending them at the same time, you know, saying you're not doing enough, but, you know, well done for doing lockdowns. And it's it seems strange to me. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, the book. Well, you know, I was talking to Dr. Unwin at Real Food Rocks. It's a food festival yeah. that... Uh, was on last year at um, in Ambleside in the Lake District. It's an absolutely beautiful location. And I was telling him that I really wanted to do this book on um, low carb on a budget because of the accusation that it's some kind of yeah, high polluting diet. So he was immediately on board and offered to write the foreword for it. Which is which? Which was such an honour because he's kind of the, um, you know, the original low carb GP in the UK in terms of uh, getting the word out there about it. For people who don't know who he is, he yeah. has saved his GP practice near Liverpool um, like fifty five thousand pounds a year just in diabetes drugs. Never mind the fact that he turned people's lives around yeah. and. Um, you know the future savings in terms of their happiness and uh, and NHS costs as well, um, and his wife, Dr. Jen Unwin's amazing too, and the work that she does. So that just spurred me on to get the book done as fast as possible. Um, I brought the digital version out in June. Um, COVID stalled the paperback coming out until last month, and um, it's really it's a, a collection of more than eighty. Um, recipes which combine my experience in a doing low carb and working in fine dining restaurants with uh, John Meehan's experience in some of the best restaurants in the UK really you know yeah. um, his take on things really raises it up a notch uh, he worked at uh, one of Yota Motolenghi's places in London he's worked at some some really great uh, places that know what they're doing with yeah. meat, fish, veg. Yeah. And I think, you know, some of his recipes just astound you because they've, they've sometimes only got two or three ingredients, but they really do it in a creative way. So I think what people are finding is that although some of the main ingredients are familiar, they are, they're, they're new lives breathed into them and people can really find the joy of cooking low carb again. There's a whole chapter on eggs for example you know the humble egg 
Um, there's a chapter on the slow cooking, uh, cheaper cuts, and um, awful. You know, it's something that people talk about, and again, it kind of sometimes falls under the um, the, the the sort of paleo police insist that you should eat liver twice a week and a lot of people don't like it very much and i can i'm the same i'm not a massive fan of of the of the taste of waffle it's it's uh, it can be quite overpowering but what what we've done with these recipes hopefully is make them delicious and accessible um so that's that's been the feedback so far people are delighted with it it's become almost like the go-to like what are we going to cook from the book this evening so if, if I imagine most of the people listening are in the UK and um, you can get it from the UK and Europe at my website and the address to go straight to the book is bit.ly, so it's B-I-T dot L-Y slash order cookbook. That's it. And if you're in America or Australia or anywhere like that, then you can go on Amazon or in America. If you're boycotting Amazon, you can go on Barnes and Noble as well. You can get it on there. Um, and and that's that's the book. It's uh, it's hopefully hopefully um, hopefully going to uh, really get out there. The the other kind of hook, if you like, and something that I, that means a lot to me about it is that um, fifty pence from each sale goes to the Public Health Collaboration, which is a charity that David Unwin is heavily involved in, which advocates for people eating quote unquote real food. And they're doing a lot of amazing work. So wanted to make sure that that was clear. Fantastic. Well, give, give us the address again, because people would well, have heard that the first time and really wouldn't have got it. Let them just write it down. So you can give us it again slowly. Sure, it's bit.ly. Yep slash order cookbook fantastic 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 and, that, and that's all they need to put in and it'll go there that's right yeah brilliant, brilliant and it's, is it available in kindle and stuff like that already yeah it's on kindle so yep. um you can go to the same address yeah um and scroll down on the website and you'll see the option to buy a digital version so if you want to buy the pdf and download it then you can from the website and if you want it directly to your Kindle, then you can go to Amazon and buy, the, buy the Kindle version as well. Okay, okay. And you're getting good reviews for the book? Yeah, it's been brilliant. Pretty much five stars across the board. <laughs> People finding that um, it's breathing new life into, into the, the, the diet for them. Yeah. And I think the fact that it does it in a way that doesn't break the bank is a big plus for yeah. people because you know a lot of the food that you get is delicious and um it's uh it's um it can be a bit fiddly sometimes whereas ours are classics with a spin and really uh, i think there'll be a few surprises in there for folk and um uh, hopefully uh, hopefully you know your listeners can can join all the people who've already uh, started to enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, it's fantastic. And the obvious thing is a lot of the books are unfortunately American or Canadian. And there's all sorts of assumptions about that we hear over here. We'd be able just to even recognize some of the names they have for alternative names for vegetables even. It's quite interesting. And processes and cups versus this, that, and the other. I think the very fact that a Glaswegian's involved in it is going to be really, really helpful. Um, and you know, unfortunately, I've always loved liver, so I'm looking forward to the liver recipes. But I think I think the thing is, um, is a lot of the people who will be watching this will be in the west of Scotland, east of Scotland, central Scotland, or whatever. Because there's a fair number of them for obvious reasons. Because I used to teach my courses up there a lot, um, and I'm from there. Where can they buy Scoundrel? Tell us the shops. Come on, let us know some of those West End shops that they're in. It's in, you know. Buy Absolutely. With Buyers Road, presumably. <laughs> well, just off, actually. So yes. um, in uh, Roots and Fruits on Great Western Road, that's yes. um, it's, well, uh, in the heart of the, heart of the West End there. Yeah, um, yeah it's... it's uh, you, they may have seen, actually, the book in... Uh, if anyone reads the the herald 
uh, Joanna Blyden's column in the Herald magazine, she um, left a, a wonderful review of uh, a really kind review of the book uh, yeah. last week, and um, uh, they might have they might have seen it already through that. Uh, but yeah, if you're in the West End, then Roots, Roots and Flowers on Great Western Road, just at Kelvin Bridge, there yeah, it has it has good. has the ice cream, a uh, lovely wee place. Yeah. And um, if you are near Blantyre, there's Green Hall Country Cafe. Uh, they've got it. They they do they do the wagyu beef, a very nice place. Yeah. And you see the cows when you go in. So if you're near there, you can go there. Um, if you're near our Paisley, then we're in uh, Barn Hill Farm Shop, uh, just near Glasgow Airport, and um, they've actually got the book as well. Um, we're in if you're if you're in sort of more northeast Glasgow, then uh, we're in Billingtons of Lenzie. It's a lovely deli out in Lenzie. Yeah. Um, and if you're in the south side of Glasgow, we're in uh, Stocks and Stems on um, Pollock Road, uh, just on Sh- just off Shawlands Cross there. Yeah. And uh, if you're in Fife, um, then we're in Loch Leven's Larder, which is a beautiful um, farm shop looking out over Loch Leven. And uh, as of this week, we are also, if you're in Edinburgh, we'll be in Margiotta in the Dash Street in the new town. Um, so we're getting out there yeah well I tell you what guys I mean many of you do do shop in wonderful food stores all around the country all around the UK and of course in Ireland why don't you go in and tell the guys about this and see if they can get a relationship going with the scoundrel production and start spreading the word because there's no doubt about it if there was keto ice cream available Tons of people would join us, you know. Uh, they just would because they would, they, they, they're, they're worried about missing these things. So I'm so excited about the, the, the scoundrel thing. Anything else you want to share with us before we go? Anything that's currently driving your passions, Ali? Uh, well, I, 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 let me just say I appreciate you, you know, what you do and getting me on because I think, um, you know, like you say, there's, this, there's the Glasgow effect and I think um, we get a bit of a we get a bit of a rough ride sometimes from our uh, our brothers down south, and um, you know. So I just really want to emphasise that I appreciate appreciate you and what you do. And um, in terms of the other things that are going on for me, um, I'm a, a bit of an obsessive about uh, getting the the word out about low carb and so on. Um, yeah. I think now that I've got the book out and the, the ice cream out, I can start to indulge more in my in my hobbies again. So uh, playing badly at golf and um, really? going back to the gym a bit more during the winter, that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Ali. Well, listen, you've been a fantastic guest. It's really exciting. Um, I, I can only imagine tons of people here are going to get that book. Uh, why not? And... Uh, I'm sure every, every one of us can't wait to taste Scoundrel. Um, that's going to be special. So, Ali, I wish you all the best for what you're doing. Have a fantastic winter. Do enjoy the golf, even if uh, you're playing in the practice greens rather than the real ones. Um, but, uh, yeah, have lots of fun. And uh, we'll keep in touch, eh? Definitely. Thanks again, Jack. Fantastic. Cheers, Ali. Thank you.